The Rosicrucian and Christianity Lectures by Max Heindel Narrated by Matthew Schmitz Lecture 14 Lucifer Tempter or Benefactor, or both Origin and Mission of Sorrow and Pain As we look about us in the world, there is no fact more potent than that, as the Hebrew poet expressed it, Man is of few days and full of trouble, and naturally we ask why this is so. The theologian tells us that it is God's decree that we must suffer because our first parents sinned, being tempted by the devil, and then he attempts to justify God by such doggerel as, In Adam's fall we sinned all. But why the eating of an apple as a cause should merit the punishment of painful parturition as an effect has always been a sore puzzle to Bible commentators and how a wise, loving, and just God could decree so much misery to the whole human race for the apparently slight fault of one pair is sufficiently hard to understand, to excuse Robert Ingersoll in a measure for exclaiming, An honest God is the noblest work of man. The seeming anomaly arises, of course, from lack of occult knowledge and consequent materialistic interpretations of that mine of occult information, the Bible, to get at the true explanation concerning pain and sorrow, we will first take the purely occult information, and then see what light the Bible gives. We remember that four great epochs, or ages, have preceded our present Aryan epoch, the Polarian, Hyperborean, Lemurian, and Atlantean epochs. In the Polarian epoch, man had only a poorly organized dense body, hence he was as unconscious and immobile as the minerals, who are now so constituted, in the Hyperborean epoch, his dense body was clothed upon with a vital body, and the spirit hovered outside. What the effect of such a nature is, we may see by examining the plant, which is similarly constituted now. There we see constant repetition, a building upwards of stem and leaf in alternating succession, that would go on ad infinitum if there were no other influence. But as the plant has no separate desire body, the desire body of the earth, the desire world, hardens the plant and checks this intense upwards growth in a measure. The creative force that cannot find its expression by making one particular plant grow taller seeks another channel. It builds the flower and embeds itself in the seed so that it may grow upwards anew in another plant. In the Hyperborean epoch, where man was similarly situated, his vital body caused him to grow to an enormous size, acted upon by the desire world, he threw off spore-like seeds which were either appropriated by another human ego or used by the nature spirits to build bodies for the animals who were then beginning to emerge from chaos. The highest life wave starts first at the opening of a period and returns last to chaos. The succeeding life waves, animal, plant, and mineral, emerge later and leave earlier. Thus in the Hyperborean epoch, when man was similar to the plants in constitution, his vital body built vertebrae upon vertebrae and would have gone on if the individual desire body had not been given him in the Lemurian epoch. That commenced to harden the structure and check the tendency to grow taller, and as a result the cranium, the flower upon the stem of the spinal column, was incipiently formed. Thwarted in its effort to build the one form taller, it became necessary for the creative force in the vital body to seek a new channel whereby it might continue its upward growth in another human being. Then man became a hermaphrodite capable of generating a new body from himself. In the plant there is no separate desire body, hence it feels no passion. It stretches its creative organ, the flower, chastely and unashamed toward the sun, a thing of beauty and delight. In man, the individual desire body must necessarily cause passion and desire unless subjugated by some ulterior means. Therefore, man is the inversion of the chaste plant, both figuratively and literally, for he is passionate and turns his creative organ towards the earth, and is ashamed of it. The plant takes its food by way of the root. Man's nourishment enters his body by way of the head. Man inhales life-giving oxygen and exhales death-dealing carbon dioxide. This is taken by the plant, which extracts the poison and returns the vitalizing principle to man. In order to check passion and prevent abuse of the creative function, several measures were adopted by the leaders in charge of evolution. This animal-like creature of mid-Lemurian times, though dreadful to look upon, was nevertheless a diamond in the rough. 
destined to become in time the perfect tool and beautiful temple of an indwelling spirit. To that end, if needed a controlling mechanism, a brain and a second nervous system capable of being controlled by will, which is the force of the prospective tenant, the ego. The whole creative force might have been used to that purpose, but as the use of any tool causes it to wear out, a way must also be devised to replace a worn-out instrument when discarded by a spirit at death, and so the creative force in each being was divided. One half was allowed to flow upwards as before, to build a brain and a larynx whereby the spirit may control its instrument and express itself in thought and word. The other half was turned downwards through the creative organs for reproduction. This arrangement has the further merit as a means of preventing abuse, that it made it harder to accomplish generation. Before the sexes were separated, each one could create without help. Under the present arrangement, each must first seek the cooperation of another person who has the opposite half of the sex force available for reproduction. That the boy changes his voice at puberty shows a connection between the creative organ and the larynx. Because half the sex force builds the brain, one who overdraws for sexual excesses becomes an idiot, while the deep thinker, particularly along spiritual lines, feels little or no inclination for coition, as he uses most of his creative force in the brain. The angels worked along with man in the Hyperborean epoch, when he had only a dense and vital body. But in the Lemurian epoch, when the desire body was added, the archangels also took a hand to help the infant human spirit to control its future vehicles. They neutralized the desire body so that it was only sexually active at certain times of the year. In the latter part of the Lemurian epoch and the beginning of the Atlantean, the brain and cerebral spinal system were sufficiently evolved so that the link of mind could be given and the ego began slowly to draw into its bodies and became an indwelling spirit in the middle of the Atlantean epoch, fully conscious of its outside environment. Before the indrawing was fully completed, particularly in the latter part of the Lemurian epoch, man's consciousness was turned inwards, and he was mostly conscious in the spiritual world. Thus birth and death were non-existent to him, as the sprouting out and drying away of a leaf is to the plant. His consciousness went on unbrokenly in the inner world, whether he had a body or not, for he was unconscious of it, though he used it equally well for all that, as we use our stomach and lungs unconsciously. At stated times of the year, the archangels withdrew their restraining influence on the desire body, and the angels marshaled humanity to great temples, where the generative act was performed at the times when the constellations were propitious. Our present-day honeymoon trips are atavistic reminders of those migrations for propagative purposes and show a connection with the heavenly bodies in the name Honeymoon. When propagation had been accomplished, the desire body was again neutralized, and in consequence there was no more pain connected with parturition than is the case with the animals at present, where similar conditions obtain now. This was a carefree state, but man was extremely limited in consciousness, led and controlled by outside agencies willy-nilly. If that condition had continued, man would have remained a God-guided automaton. He can never become a self-conscious creative intelligence, as he is destined to become, until he throws off all yokes and works out his own salvation. Therefore, great leaders from a more advanced evolution were sent to train man and awaken him to knowledge of the material world without, and of course, strong measures continued for ages were necessary. The boys were trained to develop will, which is the spiritual counterpart of their positive creative force. They were taught to carry immense burdens and steal the arm by will. They engaged in brutal fights, and their bodies were burned and maimed, impaled upon spits, etc., in efforts to awaken the ego to consciousness of the dense body and outside world. The girls were driven out into the immense fern forests which grew luxuriantly in the moist, hot soil. They were exposed to the fury of the tempests of storm-swept Lemuria and set to watch volcanic outbursts which produced pictures before their inner vision. They likewise watched the fights of the boys in order to develop their imagination. Imagination is the spiritual pole of the negative force, and it mirrored the scenes of the outside world in dreamlike pictures before their inner consciousness, and, in that way, the women were the first to become aware of the existence of the physical world and the dense body, and they started to preach the gospel of the body to men, whom they told of this dimly perceived physical existence. Some among us are now sensing the soul, 
and trying to preach the gospel of the spiritual world where the spirit lives and meet unbelief and ridicule such as the Lemurian women encountered when trying to convince their compatriots that they had a dense body. Among the observations made by these seeresses was the fact that at times a man lost his body and it disintegrated. She saw him just as before in the spiritual world, but he was gone from material existence, and it troubled her. From the angels, she could get no information. They work with the dense body, but not directly. They use the vital body as transmitter and cannot make themselves understood to a reasoning brain being. They get their knowledge without reasoning, for they send out their whole love in their world and cosmic wisdom flows in return. Man also creates by love, but his love is selfish. He loves because he desires. Cooperation in generation, for he only sends out half of his creative force in generation. The other half he selfishly keeps to build his own organ of thought, the brain. And he also uses that half selfishly to think, because he desires knowledge. Hence he must work and reason to gain wisdom. But in time he will arrive at a much higher stage than either angel or archangel. He will then have passed beyond the need of the lower creative organs. He will create by means of the larynx and be able to make the word flesh. At that stage, the woman could not reason either, for the mind was given by the powers of darkness, and it was dark, and before it could be of any use in correlating facts, it must be illuminated. Only after that has been done can man throw the light of reason upon his problems. It is here that we first hear of Lucifer, the light bringer, who speaks to the woman and helps her to solve the riddle by showing her how, with the help of the man, she may exercise the creative function independently of the angels, and in that way provide bodies when they have been lost, and in that way evade death. He inquires if God has forbidden them to eat of the tree, and it is told that they have been forbidden to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, under penalty of death. That the tree of knowledge is a symbolical expression for the generative function is readily apparent when we remember how limited the consciousness of man was at that time, he knew or was aware of nothing outside himself. His eyes had not yet been opened. His consciousness was internal, like the picture consciousness of our dreams, except that it was not confused. But he was as unaware of the exterior world and beings as we are now of the spiritual world, save at the times when he was conducted to the temples and brought into intimate sexual contact with another. Then, for the moment, the spirit pierced the veil of flesh. Then man and wife knew each other in body, and to the initiated, the Bible records these facts in a wonderfully illuminating way and continues to use the same expression in many places, such as, Adam knew his wife, and in Mary's question, how shall I conceive, seeing that I know not a man? The pain of childbirth is also more logically meted out as a penalty for violation of an injunction against sexual intercourse than as a punishment for eating an apple. The serpent said, Ye shall not surely die, for the God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as the gods, knowing good and evil. The latter was then unknown to man. Acting upon this advice, the woman secured the cooperation of man, and by the power of will they freed their desire bodies. That faculty was then much greater than now for it is a law that each new faculty is always brought at the cost of weakening some previous power, as when the faculty of thought was bought at the price of half the creative force. Then the man's willpower was such that an anxiety of the god, lest man eat also of the tree of life and become immortal, was well founded. For had he secured possession of the secret of renewing the vital body as well as the dense body, he would have been able to create a body and vitalize it forever. Then there would truly have been no death, but neither would there have been any evolution. As man did not then, as does not yet, know how to build a perfect body, that would have been the greatest possible calamity. Death is not a curse, but a friend when it comes naturally, for it releases us from an environment we have outgrown, and from a body that ties us, in order that we may get a new chance in a new and better body to learn new lessons. The untrammeled use of the sex function had the result of making man more and more conscious of his body. Their eyes were opened, and their attention focused more and more on the physical world, until by degrees they have forgotten the higher worlds altogether, and many have ceased to even believe that there is an immortal spirit in man. To them, the death of the body is of course a terrible thing, 
a dire calamity despite all assertions, because they think it annihilation. So although the word of Lucifer was true, and a new body is provided, the word of the angel was truer still, for there was no sting in death until man lost consciousness of the higher worlds. As to the curse, in sorrow shalt thou bring forth thy children, it was no curse at all, but a simple statement of the effects that it must inevitably result from the abuse or ignorant use of the creative function. While that was exercised under the wise guidance of the angels at certain times of the year, when the cosmic lines of force running from planet to planet were propitious, parturition could be accomplished without pain. But man was and is ignorant of these factors, hence he transgressed and pain resulted. Thus the brain and vocal organ have been bought at the cost of half the creative force. Freedom from the rule of the angels and the power to initiate action, to choose good or evil, and consciousness of the material world are ours at the cost of sorrow, pain, and death. But all things work for good in God's kingdom, the world. Even that which is evil is transmuted by the subtlest spiritual alchemy into stepping stones to a higher good than could have been achieved without it. Having been exiled from the Garden of Eden, the etheric region, by learning to know the material world, in consequence of repeated sexual abuse which has focused his attention here, this increased use of the desire body hardened the dense body and it began to require food and shelter. Thus man's ingenuity was taxed to provide for the body. Hunger and cold were whips of evil that called forth man's ingenuity. They forced him to think and act to provide for his necessities. Thus he is gradually learning wisdom. He provides for these contingencies before they come, because the pangs of hunger and cold have taught him to guard himself, and thus wisdom is crystallized pain. Our sorrows, when they are past, and we can calmly view them and extract the lessons they contain, are minds of wisdom and are the wombs of future joys. For by them we learn to order our lives aright, we learn to cease from sin, for ignorance is sin and the only sin, and applied knowledge is salvation and the only salvation. That seems a broad statement, but if we try it out in thought, it will be found to be as absolutely true and capable of demonstration as that twice two are four. As to the question, who are these Lucifers? For although the Bible seems to speak of only one person, that is as wrong as where it uses the singular for God in the first chapter of Genesis, they are a class of beings who attained to a stage of evolution far beyond that of our humanity in the moon period, but fell short of the development of the angels. They are demigods, and could not take a dense body like man. But neither could they gather experience as the angels are doing. They needed a brain and spinal cord, and so when man had built such an instrument, it was to their advantage to prompt him in the use of it. At that time, the opening consciousness of man was turned inwards, and he saw his inner organs and built them with the same force that he now turns outwards to build houses and ships, etc., and the outside muscles of his body, so the woman, who was most advanced in that direction, because of having her imagination trained, saw the intelligence embodied in her serpentine spinal cord, and at a later stage, when man came to record this experience, the serpent appealed to him as the nearest likeness to that which he wanted to tell about. This idea is carried out right through the Bible. In Isaiah 14 he is called Lucifer, Daystar, King of Babylon, Gate of the Sun, a city located upon seven hills, and having dominion over the world. There mankind ceased to act in unison and became separated into warring nations. It is the seed ground of all the ills imaginable, and is called a harlot in Revelation, where her fall is described. In supreme antithesis we hear of another light of the world, a bright morning star, a true light, Christ, who shall rise after the fall of Babylon and reign forever in a city of peace, Jerusalem, that is called the Bride. It comes down from heaven and has twelve gates, but they are never closed, although the precious tree of life is within. There is no outside illumination. The light is within, and there is no night. Truly a wonderful city and the greatest imaginable antithesis to the other. What does it mean? For literal interpretation is out of the question in both cases. Allowing that a city of Babylon has existed, it was not literally as described, and the future New Jerusalem is contrary to all laws of nature as we know them. These two cities must therefore be symbols. In order to unravel the meaning, let us consider that these cities are located upon seven hills or mountains, a position offering special advantages for observation. 
Moses went into the mountain and saw and heard, so did those on the Mount of Transfiguration. Daniel likens Babylon to the head of the image Nebuchadnezzar saw in a dream, and on the human head there are seven places of observation, two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, and a mouth. Upon these sits the brain, where the light-giver, reason, rules the little world, the microcosm, as the great light-giver, God, rules the macrocosm. Reason is the product of selfishness. It is generated by the mind given by the powers of darkness, in a brain built by selfishly keeping half the sex force, and prompted by the selfish lucifers. Hence it is the seed of the serpent, and although transmuted to wisdom through pain and sorrow, it must give way to something higher, to intuition, which means teaching from within. That is a spiritual faculty equally present in all spirits, whether functioning for the time being as man or woman, but it expresses itself most prominently in those incarnated in a female organism. For there the counterpart of the life spirit, the vital body, is male, positive, and intuition, the faculty of the life spirit, may therefore properly be called the woman's seed, whence all altruistic tendencies spring, and whereby all nations are being slowly but surely drawn together in a universal brotherhood of love, regardless of race, sex, or color. This brain of ours is not a homogeneous whole, however. It is divided into two halves, and it is a fact well known to physiologists that we use principally but one of these cerebral hemispheres, the left. The right half of our brain is only partially active. The heart also is on the left side of our body, but is beginning to move towards the right place. The right brain will also become more and more active, and in consequence of these two physiological changes, man's whole character will appear different. The left side is under the sway of the Lucifers and is given over to selfishness, but the ego will gain more and more control as the right side of the brain is invested with power to act upon the body as right judgment. That there is a change going on in the heart which makes it an anomaly, a puzzle, is not news to physiologists. We have two sets of muscles. One set is under the control of the will, as for instance the muscles of arm and hand. They are striped both lengthwise and crosswise. The involuntary muscles which take care of functions not under the control of the will, which cannot be moved by desire, are striped lengthwise only. The heart is the only exception. It is not under the control of desire, and yet it is beginning to show cross stripes like a voluntary muscle. In times, those cross stripes will develop fully, and the heart will be under our control. When that time comes, we will be able to direct the blood where we will to send it. Then we may refuse to send it to the left brain, and Babylon, the city of Lucifer, will fall. When the blood is sent into the right brain, we shall be building the new Jerusalem, and we are now preparing for that time by building the cross stripes on the heart by altruistic ideals, or, in the case of the pupil, by sending the sex current through the right-hand path of the heart. We remember that the cherubim awakened the life spirit, the seat of the divine love, whose shadow is the vital body, the medium of propagation, and when man was exiled from the etheric region, the Garden of Eden, with its four streams of ether, for the misuse of the sex force, the cherubim were placed before it with a flaming sword. The right use of the sex force builds an organ which will give man the key to the inner worlds and help him to create by thought. Then sorrow and pain will cease, and he will have entered the path to the city of peace. Jerusalem Lemuria, perished by fire and terrible volcanic cataclysms. In its stead rose Atlantis. In time that was buried beneath the waves and gave way to Arian, the earth as we see it at present in the Arian epoch, but that is soon past. The salamanders are beginning to stir the fires in the forge to make a new heaven and a new earth, which the western school of occultism calls the New Galilee. In the first two epochs, man evolved a body and vitalized it. In the Lemurian epoch, he developed desire. The Atlantean epoch produced cunning, and the fruitage of the Arian epoch is reason. In the New Galilee, humanity will have a much finer and more ethereal body than now. The earth will be transparent also, and as a result, those bodies will be more easily responsive to the spiritual impacts of intuition. Such a body will not get tired either, hence there is no night, and the twelve cranial nerves, which are the gates to the seat of consciousness, then as now are consequently never closed. Besides, New Galilee will be formed of luminous ether and transmit sunlight. That land will be a land of peace, Jerusalem, for universal brotherhood will bind all beings of all the earth together in love.
There can be no death, for the tree of life, the faculty for generating vital force, is made possible by means of the ethereal organ in the head already mentioned, which will be evolved in those who are even now being taken out as forebears for the humanity of that coming epoch. That race is spoken of as Christ's race, but be it understood that that is not because of an exterior Christ, but because they will evolve the Christ principle within. They will act as dictated by the Spirit through intuition, and all they do will be done in love. Only by such individual upliftment can the salvation of the race be accomplished, for as Angelus Silesius put it, Though Christ a thousand times in Bethlehem be born, and not within thyself, thy soul will be forlorn. The cross on Golgotha thou lookest to in vain, unless within thyself it be set up again.